I thought what I would do is just briefly talk about, uh, really try and get a bit of a discussion going, if, uh, if possible, uh, about this notion, uh, is bioinformatics dead? And uh, you'll see what I mean by that in a moment. But it was, this was actually in a PLOS Biology op-ed piece that I wrote earlier, well, last year, early last year. And the basic, what's driven me to this kind of notion, and I'll make these key points, is that there's something fundamentally different that I think is happening in academia right now. And of course, being, a, as Larry mentioned, the Dean of Data Science at the University of Virginia, I have a certain bias towards what I'm about to say. But I, ha I, would, I have to say that I, I can't imagine in my 40 years that there's been anything so profound as what I feel is going on right now. And an example of that came to me uh, a number of years ago, actually around 2013, uh, I was actually the um, Associate Vice Chancellor of Innovation and Industrial Alliances at uh, UC San Diego. And I went to visit uh, with a, a professor in the business school. Normally, as a professor of pharmacology, I would never come into contact with those kind of people. But uh, because of this role, I, I did go to talk to him. And I noticed on his desk a paper from PLOS Comp Bio that was actually one of our papers. And I said, oh, you knew I was coming over and you put that out. And he said, no, actually, we're using a statistical method in this paper to actually analyze Corning marketing data. And I thought, wow, that's something I never would have imagined and I never would have discovered if I hadn't wandered across campus to a completely part of, the, of, of, of where I would not normally go. So we got talking about this. We ended up having a meeting at uh, UC San Diego, which was called uh, Big Data at uh, UCSD which uh, big data was the term at the time. And that was the highest uh, attended by faculty uh, conference or meeting in the university's history. Partly because people smelt many, money, of course, around that time for big data. But uh, it was, and it was absolutely eye-opening in terms of what we discovered about each other across disciplines and what methodologies and other things. And you know, that's so, I, what I would, Posit is that's what's happening more generally now uh, across, uh, across uh, academia. And of course, one description of it is the fourth paradigm, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with, that was coined by Jim Gray, uh, who was a, uh, at ultimately at Microsoft. And really, the elements of the fourth paradigm, uh, we started uh, science through observation, then we moved to theoretical science, so observation went on for, well, thousands of years. Uh, theoretical science, you could argue, started in the 17th, 16th, 17th century and went on. Computational science probably started about 1940 or thereabouts. And now data science has sort of started uh, in, um, in probably in the last 10 years at least, historically speaking. So what's happened within these different paradigms is an absolute incredible acceleration. And I think that acceleration uh, is something that uh, is actually very profound. So let's look at this from the perspective of, uh, of what we do. So um, if I just quickly go over my own personal view of the history of bioinformatics, I would say in the 80s there were a number of us doing computation, uh, particularly on sequence data. Um, we're kind of like outcasts within the academic framework. And then what, all that changed with the Human Genome Project. So with the Human Genome Project, what we saw is the, uh, a fundamental decision that those projects could not go forward, the projects being uh, physical and genetic mapping of each chromosome at the time, without computational support. And this became a synergistic activity between experiment and computation. And of course that ultimately led to uh, bioinformatics, uh, in my opinion. That, then there was a, a what, the attraction of having the, uh, the human genome around 2000 then led to industry getting really into the business. And a lot of, I'd say about half of the bioinformaticians I knew moved to industry at that time. Then uh, when things didn't work out in the timescales that industry operates, uh, they all kind of drifted back to academia. And we went through a series of uh, periods of bioinformatics, computational biology, systems biology, to where we are today. And I would say today, what we ought to really be calling ourselves, and the name doesn't matter, it's, the, it's what stands behind the name, uh, is biomedical data scientists. 
And I say that for reasons um, that relate to what we can actually do that we couldn't do before, and to the recogni recognition uh, of what others contribute to our field. In fact, I was driven to write this op-ed piece because some very prominent uh, folks said to me at the meeting, at one on advisory board I was on, that they didn't feel that data science had anything to offer by, uh, uh, by informatics. And of course, that was beyond the, the basic notions of what we've all heard about in, in this meeting. It's full of machine learning. But there's so much more. And I think there's so much more to be got from what other fields are doing. Uh, and, and in other ways, which I'll highlight with an example. So I think the, the point being then that this digital transformation changes everything, including our own field. So an example I would just give to sort of illustrate this uh, comes from uh, this fellow, uh, Tom Hartke, who actually just came knocking on my door one day. And he was a, an emergency physician uh, in our hospital. And he said, I really got interested in, in something I've seen in an antidotal way. So I look at, I, I see a lot of trauma patients coming into the ER that have had, many of whom have had car accidents. What I've noticed over a period of time is there's a correlation between the kind of accident they've had uh, and the kind of injuries they have. Unfortunately, we don't know that when they come in. So they, we typically put them in a full body scanner and we start looking for internal injuries. And we don't actually, uh, and sometimes because of the time that takes, they die in the scanner. So if we knew what the injuries they had when they came in, uh, we could actually focus on that area and potentially save lives. So he said, antidotally, I, I see this connection, but I want to actually prove it. So he, he actually joined our Masters in Data Science program and took this on as a capstone project. And what came of it was, I think, the fundamental point here is he took data that he had access to, namely an electronic health record, where he could get the kind of information he needed uh, to look at the injuries uh, you know, post-trauma. Uh, post then, which is, I think, uh, it deserves a medal in the first place, he went to the Department of Motor Vehicles in Virginia, where we are, and basically got all of the crash data. There's a lot of public crash data. And he started making correlations. And through his work in the... Uh, in data science, he was able to actually convince the powers that be in the local districts that now they will actually forward uh, photographs of the accident to the ER uh, but before the, but the patient gets there. With it, with, and we'll see over time whether this makes any impact. The point of that story is it, to me, reflects where we are absolutely and completely in that we need to be thinking more about data from very disparate places, places that we haven't actually looked before. So the idea of putting together data from the Department of Transport with electronic health data uh, is just one example. And this is what you know, I think data science is bringing to the table. And we're trying to set up organizations that break down the silos. This is happening uh, across all institutions. There's, uh, there's some data science initiative just about at every institution. However, the idea that you're breaking down barriers to actually allow this free flow of methods and data across multiple disciplines, I think is something that we really need to be spending more time thinking about, particularly as it relates to things that we do uh, around, uh, for example, the impact of environment, uh, the idea, of course, that in, in some of the things we study, uh, even things like transport data are important, but certainly environmental data is data we don't necessarily use very much. Uh, and, and I think we just need to start thinking more broadly in the context with the, these emergent data science initiatives, what we could actually do as a field. So it's not dead, but it's somewhat different. So the questions that come to mind for me out of all of this is, first of all, do you agree with that? Uh, and, and, you know, what's next? Uh, Will data science in, in some way influence our discipline? And it's not just about the analytics piece. It's not just about machine learning, which of course is already influencing what we do. But there are, when I think about data science, we think about it as a, a sort of, we have a model for it called four plus one. The four are the quadrants of data science. Analytics, which includes machine and deep learning is one of them, but there are three others. One is systems, which is really the underlying framework and 
fundamentals of sport data science. One is design, which is about human-computer interaction. And one is about value, which is the tension that exists between doing something that could be potentially nefarious through data science tools and, and, um, and the positive aspects of that. So there's a tension there. So those are the four elements, the four quadrants. And then the plus one, of course, is all these practical applications. So I would say there are developments in fields as diverse as religious studies that could have impact on what we're doing as uh, bi bioinformatics people, if you wish. So, you know, the question is, do you agree with that? Do you see, if you, do you have, do you see this as an opportunity or a threat? Or uh, what change, you know, I'm interested in if, if you've observed some of this kind of thing in your own work. Uh, so I'm just curious as to what you feel about this. So if with that, I'll, I don't know how much time we have, Larry. If, if anyone has questions, I'd be interested. To, or comments, let's, let's try and get a discussion going. You have until 9.10. We have 20 more minutes. Oh, 20 minutes. Oh, my God. Please do. Um, so it's hard to argue with your four plus one thing, okay? Yes, we need analytics and infrastructure, uh, and values are really important, and, and right, all that seems like stuff bioinformatics needs, and already does, kind of, sort of, right? And I love the idea of, of an interchange between distant fields, and um, I, I like your religious studies example. I've been working with a, a little bit with a woman named Estelle Smith, who I think has been doing really interesting things in spiritual care, uh, AI or, or really user uh, com computational tools for spiritual support, looking at CaringBridge, one of the oldest uh, sort of pr proto-social networks in the world, which is for people who are seriously ill and for those who care about them to follow them and give them encouragement. and. Prayers, it turns out, is the biggest thing people do on Caring Bridge. And so you can build user interfaces to, you know, she, she has one thing she built where it's a flower, and the more prayers that come in, the more petals there are on your flower. And it turns out it really improves outcomes for patients, okay? It's a serious thing. So I totally agree about all that interchange. But I still have trouble with the word data science um, because I think the alternative would be data free science, of which there is none, right? I mean, how is it not something? Uh, it's a perspective, it's a, it's a useful organizing tool, it's useful for bringing in money and, and getting administrators to understand what we do matters. But I still have some issues with data science as a discipline, let alone the uber discipline over all of us and everything. No, I mean, I, I, I accept that. I've struggled with it, I still do, in, my, in myself. And in fact, it's, it's sort of reflective about how institutions think about data science, right? I mean, right now, in the US, there are only three schools of data science, which in an academic sense is you know, really planting a flag that this is gonna be here to stay. We happen to be one of them. But there's, you know, there are lots of efforts where it's just kind of an add-on, where, where people would perceive it just as an add-on to either statistics or, uh, or, or computer science or perhaps information science, as it, as it exists in an organization, which is also a reflection of where they see it sitting in the overall organization. And so, yeah, I mean, I think my, many people would think about that. And I, of course, drink my own Kool-Aid. But I actually, the fact that we've, you know, in an institution that's 200 years old and it's only a 12 school we've created, there's a commitment to see whether this is going to turn out to be different. It may not. I mean, you know, in a way, this is no different than the arguments you and I were having with other people in bioinformatics 20, 30 years ago, right? I mean, you know, is it a discipline? Is it not a discipline? In the end, who cares, you know? In fact, that's the closing statement in that uh, op-ed piece, which says, don't worry about the name, just do it. So it's sort of like, you know, I mean, yeah. I, but I don't, I don't fuss about it. As long, and and it, is, it is a vehicle to create the resources that are needed to actually change what I think is a system that really needs to be changed. So the, I, this notion, I went over to the business school and there was someone over there doing stuff that was relevant to me. You don't discover that typically you know, in a, an academic setting. So the idea that data science, for whatever it means, actually facilitates that kind of activity uh, is, is really important to me. And so in terms of what we're doing with all its complexities is to make joint appointments. In fact, an example would be Jack Van Horn, who's here today in the audience, uh, of, of joint appointments with other schools to actually foster these kinds of interrelationships.
whether it exists 20 years from now in whatever form it's called data science, I don't, to me it doesn't matter that much. Interesting. Well, in, oh good, here, go ahead. I have, I have, oh good. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's really good to hear this and I, I see this happening at, at a lot of places and, and, and I'll tell the bioinformaticians in the room, if you haven't already been getting involved in these meetings at your institution, you will be very shortly because there are very few people that their job title requires such a breadth of knowledge. And so we are naturally a, a unique fit for all these changes because they are very, very complicated changes. And, and you know, when people say data science, they're really, that's a, it's a very large picture of a lot of moving pieces and they are, are quite different than a lot of the things that we have to think about today. But I, I just wanted to say, I think we are in a good spot. And if you haven't taken advantage to get on the money train, that's behind it, please do that, <laughs> so. Yeah, thanks for that, and yes, I mean, there, there is a lot of resource, but you make me think about how to think, cast this, and kind of tie what you just said with what uh, Larry said before. So, we're in the throes of starting a PhD program in data science, right? Well, think what that means uh, in the context of this broad umbrella that you mentioned. So, if you happen to be doing uh, urban planning and, and predictive urban planning, that's how you get measured in a school of architecture as, for a PhD. It's very different than we would get measured in doing uh, you know, some form of biomedicine. And, and so, how we reconcile that is something we're, we're still working out, frankly. But it looks like that, that, that there is enough interest in seeing that crossover. And to me, the programs that have been most successful uh, in, in bioinformatics going back 20 years were those that actually cross-fertilized people. At that time, there, weren't, there were people in computer science and there were people in, bi in biology and medicine, and we started to create and train the people by dual mentorship and that kind of thing. So that's exactly what we're doing now, 20 or 30 years later. We bring someone from architecture, we have someone who has core analytics knowledge in data science, and they work on predictive urban planning uh, within this context. So, you know, that, that's just an example of how mechanically it, it can start to work. But there are lots of challenges in doing that because of just the nature of the way universities are set up. You know, it's how people get evaluated and all these sorts of things, and we can get into that, but you get the idea. Yeah, I, I want to suggest an alternative model because we're doing it at Colorado, and it's really interesting right now with thinking about what we're doing in the light of what, what you're doing. And so we're a medical campus, so our cross-cuttingness is going to be a little different than uh, an arts and sciences campus. But there's a lot of different silos in, a, in, a, in an academic medical center, and, you know, including the innovations folks, which are kind of like business people and stuff like that. And so we are creating a, a department of biomedical informatics after a long discussion with many stakeholders about the name. We decided to go for traditional. Right? Biomedical the first biomedical informatics department, uh, to my knowledge at least, in the United States was founded in the 1960s at the University of Utah. And so biomedical informatics has already had a 50-year run. Um, and I think it's safe to say, given the crowd here and our careers, that biomedical informatics will continue to be a thing for another 50 years at least. And so there, there is that kind of, I don't know, intellectual core. It doesn't really matter how you want to define what that is, but there's enough people doing it for long enough that it is something. And there is a, there is a curriculum So to the it. only comment I make about that is the I notion think. that as a, a group of biomedical informatics folks, I think it behoves taking into account a kind of cross, making sure that you take into account the interdisciplinary nature of what's going on in other areas of data science. Otherwise, it, to some degree, it doesn't matter. We're, and, we're you know, we need beers here, because I wasn't quite done. I said our cross-cutting piece, which is what, you know, I, I totally agree with you is important. It's not the department structure, but a uh, chief research informatics office. And so we are trying to push informatics throughout the medical campus um, by doing support for research the way we do support for other kinds of research, the way our kind of animal care center is, or. Uh, any one of the other major shared resources on campus. There are educational things, there are service things. Um, some, there's, a, there's a set of 
uh, you know, our enterprise data warehouse, all the kind of things you would need to get ophthalmologists to cooperate with innovations people who are working with, I don't know, public health folks or something. I mean, one way to sort of cast where we, where we are and where we're headed is to think about it in terms of someone who, who potentially in this audience, one of the young, youngest people, are just beginning to think or starting a PhD, right? What would be the difference in doing a PhD in, say, a school of data science with a biomedical uh, you know, uh, uh, theme versus doing a PhD uh, in your institution in biomedical informatics, but with a strong, let's say, analytics or some other aspect of data science component? You know, it's, it's clear, it's not clear to me where the lines are drawn. And, um, in a way, it's going to be a function of the kind of job that you want to get when you, when you finish, although it shouldn't be, but that's probably how it's perceived at this point in time. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. You know, our, our PhD program has always been very uh, oriented around methods developers. That's what we think we're producing. That's kind of our mission. And so it's very analytic in that sense, right? We are kind of computational more than a lot of biomedical informatics departments in that way. But I, I want to let Will get a word in and everybody else. Let's have some pushback here. And I don't know that I would push back exactly. I'm Will Bush from Case Western Reserve University. Something you said about the architecture reminded me of a colleague of mine at Case, uh, Roger French, who's a data scientist, um, who does what he calls industrial epidemiology. He collects data from, on the usage of solar panels all over the world. They send data, and he manages all of this into a large spark cluster. Um, and I've always been impressed by that, because first off, it's like a complete meld of totally disparate disciplines. Um, but it also reminds me, you know, one of the things that I think we miss in, in data science, because we're so methods driven, as Larry just pointed out, is we sometimes forget, I think, to educate our students, whether it's biomedical or industrial or architectural data, that all of the data that we have has biases in it. Um, and, you know, having that, even though we all, you know, roll our eyes when we think about the, the crusty old field of epidemiology, like the, the, the sort of core tenets of that, I think, need to be baked into data science so that we really understand what we're modeling from the data that we've got and that we aren't making kind of false inferences. Right? Yeah, no, I think that's obviously critically important. And with some of the kinds of things I've discussed here from time to time, we may hear more about that this evening, I don't know. <laughs> but... Yeah, and I, don't, I, I actually think data science is a, an opportunity. I mean, what I would say, and it's perhaps a bit heretic, is that within computer science and engineering, I don't think the, the, the nature of bias, and by broaden that to potentially the ethical consequences, mm. um, have really been dealt with very well at all. Right. I mean, frankly, at our place, we have you know, a science and society department uh, within uh, our School of Engineering, and it's kind of like a, a pimple on a... It's kind of, you know, <laughs> some, of the, some of the stuff is like broccoli. You know, it was described to me as being like broccoli. You yeah. know you need it, but you don't like it, right? right? So, it, and, and I think what we're trying, to, at least what we're trying to do, and I would say this is true of a number of other data science initiatives, is really to weave this notion of whether it be bias or more generally the ethical aspects of what we're doing into every, every single uh, thing that we do, whether it be research, service, or education. So we act, when I mention this four plus one model, we have a color coding, and we look at every course. So it could be a deep learning course, but we look to see that there's some notion of value, which is the piece you're talking about, embedded within that course. And of course, it's particularly important there, but it also turns out to be important almost everywhere, at every aspect you look. Just think about the visualization. Mm -hmm. I almost decided, was almost decided to give a talk when I was asked to do this at 10 o'clock last night <laughs> on the curse of the ribbon. Because when you think about visualization, you know, visualization is also a form of bias in some ways. So, or it can be. And the notion about the curse of the ribbon is that we think, you know, we've looked at ribbon drawings of proteins for so long, we think that's exactly what a protein is. Mm -hmm. And it's a little limiting in that way. It's a sort of friendly bias, if you like. But, you know, I think when you start seeing methodologies and visualization techniques and human-computer interactions that are different, that are coming from architecture. I mean, I've learned so much. We're building a building right now. Just the, archi the architectural <laughs> aspects and the visualization that goes on there, which is data science, yeah. is quite, quite outstanding. Mm -hmm. So you also made me think of one other thing, which is the notion that, of the tension that's really between data science and data engineering. But that's a whole other aspect of this, this, this story. <laughs>
Hi, Phil, since you kind of name checked me there a little earlier, I'm Jack Van Horn and I'm a faculty member in the School of Data Science uh, working uh, very closely with Phil. I also have a joint appointment in the uh, Department of Psychology at UVA and it was part of that balance was a real opportunity from my perspective of joining the University of Virginia and being working at that intersection of the brain sciences and the data sciences. And I believe that brain science and data science are intimately linked. You cannot pull them apart. And if you look at NIH initiatives, whether it's the brain or some other organ system, data science ends up being a critical element in every one of those. These are these big U-class grants that you, you know, U54 class grants that you see all the time. Enormous opportunities, enormous professional opportunities and personal opportunities um, are, exist at this intersection of the data science and, uh, and other sciences. So having um, joint appointments um, is, is super important and I wanted to point out that um, I think the School of Data Science this year is doing like what about 15 hires at all different levels. I'm in charge of two such hires um, which we call the at scale hires. We're looking for people doing data science at scale. If that is you, you may want to apply for those jobs. There are like 13 other searches going on for people who are um, what we call the academic general faculty as well as tenure track faculty as well. Huge opportunities for those of you who are at that stage where you're trying to find that job, you're a postdoc now and you're looking for a faculty job, uh, take a look at this because it's really exciting and UVA is growing uh, in leaps and bounds and in a, about a year and a half there'll be a new building and uh, so really great opportunity for you to kind of do something similar. Again, working and finding those friction points at the intersections of these different disciplines in data science, great opportunity. Thank you very much for plugging the school. I didn't want to do that myself. It seemed to be, <laughs> it's, it's, it seemed to be too self-serving. I'm just ha but, ha happy yeah. to be here. And I didn't set you up for that, uh, so I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Actually, he pays himself. I, mean, I, would, I would just say a couple of other thoughts that are not necessarily related to what Jack's plugging for us, but is that also, I think, and it really relates to academia more generally, and, it's the, uh, and I think data science, for us at least, is an opportunity to address that. I think generally academia does a fairly poor job at public-private partnership, uh, and you know, to me this is such a, a critical part of what, uh, what the future has to hold. And particularly, as in so many ways, data science advances are coming outside of academia, at least they, they have been in my view. So uh, I think it, those kinds of partnerships are going to be increasingly important. And we, we're trying to really uh, balance those um, as much with tuition and F&A on grants and so on uh, as everything else. So uh, it, it just, that's, that's the level of importance we put on it. I guess we're almost out of time. Good morning, it's great to be here. Uh, this is my first time at PSB. What a great conference. Uh, I'm really uh, delighted to be able to talk about whatever I want, uh, as is the nature of the Terry Talks, and I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk about something I really care about, which is um, the pitfalls of contemporary genomic variation representation. Um, I'm Alex Wagner, I'm an assistant professor at Nationwide Children's Hospital and The Ohio State University. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. Um, just a few notes about this presentation. I think there's a mention that, like, you know, people should say if they want their stuff tweeted, so feel free to tweet. Um, all of this is uh, CCBY licensed. That means you can share it, reuse it, remix it, whatever you want to do with it. Um, just say where you got it from. And then uh, finally, I'll, I'll provide a link to all the materials here, so um, don't feel obligated to take a bunch of pictures unless you want to. That's totally fine. And um, I want to start with uh, just a, a quick uh, case study, if you will, about variation representation in the news. So uh, a few years ago in 2014, um, the uh, Daily Mail, which is the UK's uh, most prestigious um, peer-reviewed tabloid, uh, gave this world exclusive about how Jack the Ripper was unmasked by an amateur sleuth. And this uh, amateur sleuth used DNA uh, a DNA breakthrough to identify Britain's most notorious criminal, Jack the Ripper, uh, solving a 126-year-old cold case. Um, and of course, uh, the, the notion of, of doing this was uh, pretty dramatic. 
uh, they came out and said that, okay, this is uh, Polish-born Aaron uh, Kosminski, who was Jack the Ripper, um, based off of DNA evidence they found on an, on an old shell that's been handled by a lot of people. Um, of course, uh, these types of claims are pretty dubious in nature, and so there was a uh, uh, you know, pretty thorough and, and rapid response by the uh, bioinformatics community, and six weeks later, another article comes out, Jack the Ripper, scientist who claims to have identified notorious killer, has made a serious DNA error. This is an error of nomenclature. You don't really get to see error of nomenclature that much in the news, so I was very excited to be able to share this with you. Um, and basically, this error undermined the, the notion that it was this Polish immigrant uh, who was carrying out the, the atrocious murders in 1888. This came out on October 20th. So what happened? What was the cause of the error? Well, here's the, uh, the logical process that was um, undertaken to provide the notion that uh, Kosminski was the killer. Uh, DNA sample, uh, including his blood, uh, included mitochondrial variation, uh, an insertion in the sample that was not found in a large uh, forensic mitochondrial database uh, indicated this might be a private familial variant. And a descendant of the suspect Kosminski's sister also has that same familial variation. Therefore, uh, it must be Kosminski. Now, of course, um, I'm in a room with a bunch of scientists, so as you all are probably recognizing, there are many shortfalls in the conclusions drawn here. Um, but the key piece of evidence in itself was also misidentified. And here's what happens. So that private familial variation was written in the forensic mitochondrial DNA nomenclature. It was uh, indicated as 314.1C. Here's a representation of that region of mitochondrial sequence from the UCSC genome browser um, on genome build uh, GRCH38. Uh, of course, GRCH38 was released in 2013, the year before this uh, amateur sleuth took a stab at solving this case. Um, in the reported frequency of 314.1c in the large forensics database uh, was in fact absent, uh, and this was of course the key piece of evidence. Um, unfortunately, uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, trying to do sequence and variant calling in uh, homopolymer regions, here we see there are a series of repeating cytosines, and the cytosine insertion, if it occurred at any one of these positions indicated by these arrows, uh, effectively results in the same resultant sequence. And so you can't actually tell where it occurred because we're only looking at the final state with sequencing data. And so then the question is, which one of these, uh, you know, do we say the variation is? And different variation standards have uh, different conventions for conveying that. In the case of this particular convention, um, this is the DNA Commission of the International Society for Forensic Genetics. I didn't know that was a thing, but it is. Guidelines for mitochondrial DNA typing um, in uh, the year 2000 basically states that in the case of homopolymeric tracts, where the exact position at which the insertion has occurred is unknown, the assumption is always made that the insertion occurred at the highest numbered end of the homopolymeric region. Therefore, and this is the funniest part of all, the exact event that they misreported is indicated as an example in the nomenclature <laughs> stating that for a homopolymeric region at which insertions are common, occurring between positions 311 and 315 inclusive, the polymorphism, a cytosine insertion, is assumed to occur after site 315, so the nomenclature for this is in fact 315.1c. And if you take a look at that private familial variation represented at 315.1c, you find out that it's in fact present in over 99% of people among European descent. So uh, in fact, it's, it's an extremely common variant. It's not surprising at all that it was on the shawl that had been passed from collector to collector for years on end before um, some mysterious uh, DNA extraction technique was used and, and the, the resulting mit mitochondrial DNA sequenced. So this gives you a, you know, a taste about why variation representation matters. Now, I know most of us aren't out you know, um, trying to solve 126-year-old cold cases, but many of us do care about the application of genomic knowledge to variant interpretation in clinical settings. And uh, seeing that that's a theme of this conference, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how that motivated our search for better formats and variation representation. So a few words on, on why this matters to us. 
Um, so I work at the Institute for Genomic Medicine, and you know, genomic medicine is all about taking patient or tumor DNA, turning that into a clinical genomic variant report, using that report to then inform clinical care and decision making. And the process of doing this, uh, there is something that we call the interpretation bottleneck. This is a figure from Good et al. in 2014. Um, and this interpretation bottleneck is the process by which we take all the automated variant calling and annotation work uh, that we're able to do uh, quite rapidly in, in cloud workflows, and then try and turn that into that clinical report. And this involves uh, the laborious efforts of a, a clinical pathologist um, who is, is basically looking through uh, the molecular data and trying to make a determination about the clinical relevancy of the variants they observe. This process can take anywhere from six to eight hours per case. There are a number of, of uh, different reported values for the average time for these cases, but it, it's, it's quite an extensive effort. And so one of the things we sought to do was uh, try and reduce one of the main challenges in this interpretation burden, which is uh, instead of uh, making the analysts go to each independent genomic knowledge silo and interpret the, the data there and add that evidence to their reports, instead we said, can we harmonize these data, provide a centralized interface, and standardize the way that we represent that evidence? And uh, we did this, uh, in, in, this publication came out in 2020 in Nature Genetics, and in what you can see here, there are six different uh, public uh, somatic cancer knowledge bases, that's, that's the field I study, is somatic cancer variation, and what we were looking at is how do we look at the clinical evidence uh, in these knowledge bases as it pertains to that variation. And it might be a little bit difficult to see, but inside these uh, colorful pills here, each one of these represents basically a piece of evidence that exists from one of these resources. Uh, there are different shapes. And those shapes that look like uh, small pluses, those are custom uh, values, custom representations of data that exist in these knowledge bases that don't conform to any known standard or are not linked to any reference data, et cetera. And so there was a, a very large data integration and harmonization challenge that, is, that went with this project. And at the end of the day, we had this harmonized knowledge base, and we took a look at the underlying data and said, what can we learn from it? And we saw uh, one very, very important finding, which is almost none of it overlapped. Right, so this is an upset plot. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with this type of plot, it basically measures set intersections. Uh, can you see my mouse here? No, yeah, there we go. Um, it measures set intersections. So uh, along the, the rows here, we see different resources. Uh, and each colored circle represents basically that that resource is included in the uh, set intersection associated with the, uh, the, the column above it. So, in the civic resource, for example, there are 597 variants that have evidence uh, surrounding clinical interpretation that are not present in any other resource. Uh, similarly, there are, uh, for OncoKB, 185. And so um, the key takeaway of this figure is that you've got to go pretty far out into this tail before you find these kind of ubiquitously expressed or even highly over overlapping or intersecting variants. And in fact, across these knowledge bases, over 76% of all variants were represented only once across the six, and fewer than 10% were represented three or more times, and that's discounting all the nuances about what the associated evidence was. So this is just variant coverage. So clearly there's a need to do this, so we looked at how we can scale computation, uh, the computability of this evidence through uh, better tools for variation representation, the idea being that if you have a data generation pipeline, you get a VCF, you get some HDVS, you get some uh, you know, read caller specific CSV, and you want to take that data and you want to annotate it and you want to apply evidence to it and come up with a preliminary classification that you can then pass on to a clinical pathologist, how do you do that? And this involved uh, basically the determination of how we build a machine semantics model for variation and from that be able to represent it in all the forms that clinicians are familiar with, HGVS, IACN nomenclatures, et cetera. <clears throat> so we looked around at, at existing specifications uh, to help us with this product uh, process. We saw, uh, you know, VCF files, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ubiquitous uh, variant calling format for representing genomic sequence variants. HGVS, which is uh, kind of the de facto reporting uh, variant standards, so people want to describe variation in, in a human-readable syntax, HGVS does that. And then Speedy, which is an NCBI uh, representation of variation for contiguous uh, sequence changes. This is a format uh, that basically does sequence, position, deletion, insertion, hence the SPDI or Speedy. 
uh, it's, it's often used as a primary key, and it's, uh, it's useful in a lot of the NCBI resources, such as ClinVar. Um, and then, of course, there are a number of associated registered variation resources, where you can just get an ID for variation. You can use that ID and pass that around with your, with your evidence. And of course, uh, we took a look at all these and we said, well, there's, there's so many choices and they're all ridiculous. Um, we need to do something better. Let's create something new. And so now there is one more ridiculous choice. And so um, how we did this is we worked with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. So this, for those of you that are unfamiliar, the GA4GH is a, it's a global uh, data sharing uh, standards development organization. They build data standards to help uh, facilitate uh, the responsible and ethical sharing of human genomics and health data. Uh, the working model is basically six technical and two foundational work streams across a variety of large national and international data initiatives. A few of them are listed here, the Variant Interpretation for Cancer Consortium, the All of Us Research Program, the Australian Genomics, uh, H3 Africa, GEM Japan, ClinGen. These are, all, uh, these are some of the 27 driver projects that constitute the GA4GH, and between them, they develop standards for how they communicate genomic and health data between them. Some of their greatest hits include uh, the SAM-BAM alignment file formats, uh, the CRAM alignment storage file format, the BED genomic features file format, um, the VCF variant call file format, and many more things that are not file formats um, that help us with the way that we uh, describe workflows, the way we do compute in the cloud, the way we visit and share and authenticate uh, data and data access. Uh, there's a lot more to the GA4GH standards, but because I'm talking about variation representation, I'm keeping it to the, to the, the basics. Uh, but if you want to find out more about the other GA4GH standards, uh, this link is in the slide deck. Feel free to click through it and take a look. So I wanted to talk about that, that new emergent uh, variation representation specification. Uh, GA4GH uh, variation representation specification, or VERSE, um, is one of the, uh, it's one of the newer standards of the GA4GH. It was developed out of the need to create that semantic precision and computability for variation. And uh, importantly, VERSE has a number of different components uh, that, that build up from a foundation of a terminology and information model for the various concepts that constitute variation. From that, we build a schema so we can validate messages as we transmit them over the wire. Implementation guidance that allows us to uh, do all of the correction and normalization work that's necessary. And finally, reference implementation so you can just boot up a Python terminal and do it. Uh, it has an extensible information model, number of different things, variation blocks, location blocks, um, blocks for representing sequence expressions. And I wanted to talk now about what those pitfalls are that we learned as we were developing the specification. Um, and importantly, why these uh, challenges uh, persist and, and how they can complicate the way that we integrate genomic evidence. So the first of these is variation over precision, going back to our Jack the Ripper case. Uh, you know, we, we just talked about uh, homopolymeric regions. I, I think that for those of you that have looked at this before, you'll know that, of course, the different standards that are out there right now do things very differently when it comes to these types of repeating insertions. So uh, here, for example, is an insertion of a CAG inside of a CAG repeating sequence. It's like uh, CAG, 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 C. That's, that's 2.3 uh, repeats of the CAG uh, in the reference, add another CAG in. Where does that actually land? If you were to do this in VCF, of course, you left shuffle. You put it all the way to the beginning of the ambiguous region. You say that's where the insertion occurs. If you're doing this in HGVS, you go all the way to the three prime end. Uh, so on the genome, of course, that's on the opposite end. If it's a, if it's a negative strand transcript, it's going to overlap in terms of its position and its projection. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, it, it goes to the other end of the sequence. And then finally, if you're using something like Speedy or GA4GHverse, uh, they, don't do an, an, they don't do an arbitrary choice. They don't say, you know, okay, I'm going to put the CAG at the beginning, I'm going to put it at the end. Instead, they say, here's the entire region of ambiguity, and the new variant here is that same region plus the repeated sequence that was added. And the key point here is that they're not being over-precise. And in fact, the algorithm associated with, with identifying this region is called the Variant Over Precision Correction Algorithm, made by the NCBI, uh, written about in their speedy paper. Um, and this allows us to get around this challenge of uh, picking an arbitrary coordinate for where variation occurs. <clears throat> 
Um, this is a, an example of some data that, that's, uh, that's existent in one of our clinical evidence resources. This is the BRCA exchange, one of the GA4GH driver projects. Uh, Melissa Klein runs this resource. Uh, she's uh, shown here in the bottom right uh, corner of this slide. This is her slide. And she basically shows uh, how that same change looks very different depending on what standard you're using and talks about some of the challenges in terms of alignment, representation, and match. Uh, that occur as you're trying to pull together and integrate information from various sources that use these different formats. Um, moving on to the second pitfall, there's uh, a big challenge that I think is often goes unaddressed is uh, coordinate systems. And in particular, the way that we treat certain types of genomic events and how they are tightly linked to the way we think about coordinates. So here, for example, we have um, a, a sequence, an arbitrary sequence, uh, with uh, positions six and seven highlighted in residue coordinate systems. So a la VCF, HGVS, et cetera, the, uh, the number one position is the first nucleotide in the sequence. And what we see is if you want to represent the position between these two indicated nucleotides, these A and G here, if you want to represent that, that position between them, you use residues six and seven. That's the, the, these are the coordinates. Um, if you want to do the same thing, if you want to represent A and G, including those, again, the sequence is six to seven uh, when talking about deletions or substitutions of these. So the coordinate six to seven can be inclusive or exclusive depending on the type of variation operation taking place. And so, of course, uh, many of us have had to write bioinformatics uh, workflows and, and use programs that have to do this type of translation effort under the hood and use that contextual information to represent what the coordinates actually mean. And so uh, one of the things that we tried to, to do to get around this is to build out a coordinate system where you don't need notion of what kind of variation is taking place to understand what the coordinates or location is. And so this is called the inter-residue coordinate system. Uh, it goes by various other names, including uh, zero-based. Um, and the idea here is that the, the, the zero is kind of the position preceding the first nucleotide of the sequence, and every subsequent number represents kind of the space in between nucleotides or amino acids uh, in other sequences. And therefore, if you want to identify a, a position between two nucleotides, uh, you simply have the inter-residue coordinate of that position uh, twice. So here we see uh, sequence 6, 6, meaning uh, this position right here, or sequence 5 to 7, uh, going uh, and encapsulating these two amino acids. So these, uh, these are unambiguous coordinates. They mean the same thing regardless of operation, and they allow us to do um, quite a bit more in terms of uh, genomic matching without a lot of additional complexity and processing under the hood. Pitfall number three is uh, nomenclature inconsistency. Uh, so many uh, systems, such as HGVS, uh, allow multiple representations of the same concept, and it really requires you to be aware of the reference um, and some uh, arbitrary rules regarding what type of variation it is. Uh, for example, uh, here's a, uh, a commonly observed uh, protein variation in the, in the cancer literature. Uh, this is ERBB2 or HER2, a famous cancer gene, um, and a E77D uh, Delens EAYVM. And basically it's saying that at this E770 position on our reference protein, uh, there's an insertion of EAYVM and it replaces the E and okay, great. That's a, that's a, a novel variant uh, for amino acid insertion. Um, but if you were to uh, do the standard HGVS representation of this, first of all, you don't use the gene, you use the, the reference sequence, and that's great. Uh, but second, uh, you need to actually indicate that, oh, wait, if you look here, AYVMA, this is a, this is a repeating sequence, and YVMA continues that repeating sequence. Therefore, this is a duplication of these four amino acids, and the, it actually occurs here. These are entirely non-overlapping. Right? This is the same nomenclature. This is the HGVS pro, uh, protein nomenclature. These are entirely non-overlapping variants. The protein sequences are identical. It's the same variant. And so there are challenges then when trying to aggregate just from HGVS strings in the literature because these representations exist. These are, these are how people report this because they're unaware or they're, they're, their tooling does not provide um, accessibility to the underlying reference sequence to allow them to identify, oh, this should be represented as a duplication and not as an insertion. And of course, all these different representations uh, exist on a number of different scales, right? So here we have a genomic variant at the very bottom, uh, two representations of it, another two representations of that same genomic variant on a different reference genome, GRCH 37 and 38. 
And then we have the transcript variation that it projects up to. And from there, the protein variation that it translates to. And each one of these has several HGVS descriptions on how this variation should be represented. And so if you're trying to do string matching, you're trying to do HGVS comparisons, there's actually a bunch of under the hood work you need to do to take this stuff and bring it down to the same fundamental variation concept for doing this matching. So we address this problem by coming up with a, a strategy, an algorithm, by which we get rid of all of the human identifiers and all of the human labels, and we build a computational model using verse of that variation, and then we can take that computable representation and we can um, derive a computed identifier from it. And what this means is that now all of these human identifiers can be represented under the same computed identifier anywhere in the world. If you have a novel sequence and it matches a known reference sequence and you are completely unaware of that and you run this algorithm, you get the same identifier for the same variant on that matching sequence. Because it is, it is described not by the reference and not by the identifier of the reference, but rather by the data itself. Finally, uh, and this is probably the largest pitfall of all, uh, is the artificial equivalence of assayed and categorical variation. And what do I mean by this? So observed or assayed variation is, is kind of what we see in the clinical laboratory setting, right? You do an assay, you get back a genomic finding or an RNA finding, et cetera, and what you want to do is return relevant evidence from genomic knowledge bases. There are a number of such knowledge bases uh, that might be applicable. So here we have, for example, a transcript variant on some, some cDNA. We want to say, how does this variant get represented and, how, and what's the uh, relevant knowledge we want to collect for it? We go to the genomic knowledge bases, and there are a number of different identifiers it could be associated with. Right? So we, we want genomic knowledge associated with ClinVar variation 13961. And this has a display name of a, a transcript variant using the main select transcript, which is not the same one as yours, but it is considered equivalent uh, for the purpose of the associated annotation. The civic variant 12, which is the BRAF V600E protein variant, uh, which is the translational uh, product of this uh, observed cDNA change. And then finally, the dbSNP identifier, which includes this actual change at the genomic level, but also other changes that don't have the same protein effect. And so you want to be able to capture all of the associated annotations with each of these concepts, but these are not equivalent concepts, right? The contextual variation does not match. And so again, we find ourselves needing to uh, reiterate and repeat uh, you know, how, we, uh, how we look at and how we match to variation in these knowledge bases. Um, and everyone's got to go through this same engineering effort and tooling effort in order to make that work. Um, Speedy took a, a stab at, at addressing this by defining uh, how you can describe alleles um, as contextual or canonical, contextual alleles being kind of the one facet, uh, the GRCH37 representation, a transcript representation. Uh, the canonical allele then is one selected contextual allele that kind of represents the set of all of the associated um, you know, uh, contexts that you think are relevant to that canonical allele. And in practice, uh, you know, this is provided in resources like ClinVar. So here we see uh, you know, the ClinVar variation 13961. And there's what, like 20 HGVS descriptions for this variant? And the display name matches one of them. Um, but it's across multiple builds, across multiple transcripts, multiple protein consequences, consequence representations. And it has the canonical variant at the bottom, the canonical speedy variant. And what this shows us is that, okay, you know, if my observed, my assayed variant matches one of these, I know I've got a hit, and that's great. But what happens if you have an ENST identifier? Those aren't listed on this table. Do those match? How do you know? Um, what about other congruent transcripts? What if you're working off of a, an annotation set from a, another national provider? And, uh, you know, other resources like Civic, for example, and by the way, just to be clear, I love all of these resources. They're not doing a bad job. They're doing the same job. They're, they're all trying to simplify and represent variation in ways to make it linkable and findable. But it's actually quite challenging. Um, and so, anyways, Civic has a canonical variation concept at the very top, this, the V600E protein change. Uh, it links it to a, bu a bunch of other resources that have different contexts and different meanings. 
And at the end, there are multiple associated ClinVar canonical variation records. And we're trying to grab all of that and, and use all of that, and we're doing it in a way that's very imprecise and makes matching very difficult to do. So what we're working on next is how we can describe variation in this aggregate form as categorical definitions. Uh, these are contexts that are described by you know, a, a single contextual allele and defined by additional properties. We're using verse objects as a way of defining what those properties are. All right, uh, so I'm reaching the end of my time here. Uh, I wanted to uh, just ask a, a few favors of the audience. First, uh, please provide feedback on my talk. I'm trying to uh, grow as a scientific professional and uh, feedback on the presentation material. What you loved, what you hated, it's all welcome. Please go to this link, uh, let me know how I did. Uh, second, uh, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to say that I'm, I'm looking to hire postdocs. If you're, if you're interested in working on any of these challenges, uh, we have several funded grants uh, and looking for talented uh, postdoctoral applicants to, uh, to help us uh, advance that work. Then finally, um, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know, if you, as promised, if you wanted to see these slides, uh, the, the short link is at the bottom there, go.osu.edu slash PSB22, and you can get all the content and links, et cetera, that I talked about today. Thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, two minutes for questions. Four minutes for questions. So uh, first of all, thank you for bringing up this topic. Uh, I'm probably one of the very few people in the room, or maybe not one of the few people in the room, that has literally died and bled over these issues over the years. Uh, I've been training bioinformaticians who come from great programs. They're, they're very smart, uh, but they're completely unprepared from their academic training to work in clinical genetics, uh, not with the clinical side or the medical knowledge, but the level of precision required to appropriately use the, the sequence data, the research grade tools, and apply it to, to real patients. And the amount of time and effort and training that it takes in industry, in practice, is just tremendous. So uh, I'm both agreeing with virtually everything that you said. I've got some quibbles around some of the technical conclusions we can talk about later. But I would also ask all of the educators in the room to think about and be very careful about the difference between research grade findings and tools and publications and processes and how do you actually start applying those to, to human life and, and to safety um, and that our, our education programs already try and cover a huge, uh, a huge gamut of, of things that uh, our, uh, our um, methods developers and, and, uh, and researchers have to do but uh, really think about the quality of what we do, because right now I think most of our clinical genetics infrastructure is built on very shaky foundations, and it, re it requires folks like, like us who talk about these things in, in sort of weird forums to, to remind ourselves that we are, we're going straight from graduate student who just wants to get out of there to patient and with very little barrier or, or control. Thank you for that comment. Hi, Eric Newman from MITRE and also IDACA. Very nice uh, presentation showing a, a, an issue where uniqueness is going to be very, very powerful in looking at different sequences. Uh, my question is, even though you have now a unique way to represent different variants, uh, have you considered the cases where you have information from, let's say, uh, parents or ancestors where you see already a proto kind of change, but then the additional change, you would lose the directionality where it came from. And so is there a way to both capture the uniqueness of the final sequence, but also when you have evidence from ancestors can link in which way it did come in, sort of error-wise or something? Yeah, great question. Um, I think uh, the short answer is yes, you can represent reference matched alleles, right? So the idea here is if you had a, if you have, a, if, you're, if, your ancestor, if your ancestor has a, a, a variant uh, compared to the reference, then you have a change on that variant to reference, uh, you, can, you can represent that reference concept using the, the specifications described here. Um, I, but more generally to the point of, you know, is it, is it useful and practical to do so? Absolutely. 
I think it's also, I think that's beyond maybe the scope of variation representation formats, right? This is, mm -hmm. this is more a question of, of clinical messaging systems. Right. Um, and uh, to that point, I completely agree that that should exist. Uh, to the extent they're able to represent, uh, you know, everything regarding uh, uh, clinical phasing, uh, everything regarding, you know, parental uh, lineage and, and inheritance of um, your uh, genetics and, and how they vary from your ancestors, I think is all extremely useful clinical data. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's Bin Lan from Stanford. I feel like the talk content of talk really applies to what we are dealing with in the daily work, especially with like genomics and clinical uh, annotations, representation of variants, which really really influence how we rec correctly recognize mutations that's present in patients. So I'm just wondering, with the ch change of us, uh, it's maybe a practical question. So with the change of the speedy. Uh, variant representation format. Do you imagine this will bring about a change in the file format where we represent the genetic data? So instead of using VCF, this is now we're having to, going to, also going to change how we represent coordinates and uh, maybe essentially coordinates and alleles in the VCF format. Uh, the short answer is I hope so, um, but I, th I think the realistic answer is probably not. Um, the, what it boils down to is that when you have an established specification like VCF, uh, it can be quite challenging to uh, do a fundamental change like your coordinate system, even in a major version release. Uh, though I would certainly encourage the, the VCF uh, specification uh, maintainers to consider this with the upcoming VCF 5 specification, which they're currently discussing. All right. Thank you.